I wanted to talk this morning a little bit. I was praying about a message for this morning. I wanted to talk a little bit. Last week we were talking about crucifixion. Christ and Him crucified. And I wanted to talk a little bit about crucifixion. Uh, I, you know, most of us are familiar with the story. I think all of us are probably familiar with the story of Christ's death and His burial and His resurrection. That's the gospel message. And some of you may have even uh, studied a little bit about crucifixion. It's something the Romans didn't invent it. it they had been doing it for a while, but they, they, uh, they took it to another level because the Romans like to really uh, put their stamp on things. Uh, crucifixion in the Roman Empire was a payment for certain crimes, murders, thieves, uh, people who would rebel against the Roman Empire, escaped slaves could be crucified. But the, only, the one person that couldn't be crucified was a Roman citizen. They, did not, they would not crucify anybody that had Roman citizenship. It was that brutal and that inhumane of a death. And uh, I know that many of us have seen movies and uh, recently with the, with the Passion of the Christ, some very graphic uh, description. But the Holy Spirit, as he inspired the gospel writers, did not inspire them to give a graphic description of crucifixion. It was pretty plain and uh, straightforward. But all that process, the scourging, the beating, and the crucifixion, it was all part of the, it was all part of the program. Uh, they wanted, when they crucified somebody, they wanted to be sure that to make it as painful as possible, so uh, to exact whatever punishment the person was, was uh, found guilty of, the beating, the crowns, the scourging, it was all meant, designed to be as painful as it could be without, without literally bringing death until, of course, they would be nailed to the cross. Not only was there physical pain, but then there was, when Christ was crucified, there was the pain of having his disciples betray him and leave him, uh, desert him, the mocking that he was receiving from the very people that he came to, to die for. The Romans also determined that crucifixion would be a public thing, something that would be done in, out in the open. They would do it uh, on on. Uh, Pop, uh, very populated roads, well-traveled roads, uh, mount, hills and mountains where people could see. They wanted it to be a spectacle. They wanted, they wanted everybody else to see what would happen if they were to dare to come against the Roman Empire. It was meant to be public. It was meant to be a spectacle, a warning, and a testimony as to what the power of the Roman Empire was. And finally, it was meant to be permanent. Somebody say, well, what do you mean by that? That meant if a person was crucified, there was no like, well, we'll crucify you for a couple hours and let you down. If you were put on that cross, it was meant, you meant to stay there until you died. And sometimes it would take people days to die. It was not necessarily a quick death. Uh, if you read in the Gospels, when they went to break the legs of the thieves, it was actually an act of mercy because they needed to push themselves up to be able to breathe. And by breaking their legs, they would, they would, they would suffocate. So they were, they were in, in, in essence, they were having mercy on them because they, some people could hang on the cross there for like days and, uh, until they finally perished. They knew how to put the nails in the arms to miss the arteries and veins. You know, they would put them in between the, the bones. You have two bones there so you could hang there. So they were, they were really good at what they did. And I, I said all that to say this, that crucifixion is, is, a, is an integral part of the Christian lifestyle. Not meaning that we're all going to be nailed to a cross someday. But the fact is, if we're in Christ, we have been nailed to a cross. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to a very uh, well-known passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 16. And this is uh, one that we've visited many, many times. And we're going to start at verse 13. While, while we, we enjoy each other's company and while we like to fellowship and come together and be blessed, and those are good things. Fellowshipping in church is good. Christianity isn't a party. Christianity, being like Christ, is a challenge. 
Jesus said this, or says this in Matthew chapter 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you're John the Baptist, that some Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God, which was the right answer. Jesus was asking his disciples, this was just a few months before his crucifixion, and again, we've, we've been through this passage many times. Some of you have heard, heard this over and over again. It was just a few months before his crucifixion, and, and he, was, he was lining his disciples up, and he was saying, what, what are you saying about me? What, what do people say about me, and what do you say about me? And the people said, well, you know, you're a man of God. You may be Jeremiah or Elijah or somebody who come back from the dead. When Jesus asked his disciples, Peter said, well, listen, you're the Son of God. You're the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Well, that's a good answer. This is a good, this is a good uh, uh, portion of Scripture. This is an uplifting. He was in a place called Caesarea Philippi, as, as far as from Jerusalem as, as he could be and still be in Israel. And, and it, it, this, is a good, this is a good answer. This is a, a, a good, a praise the Lord. We read this and we say, Thank God. Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said to Peter, And I say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Well, that sounds good. You know, I got, we, got, we got the keys. We got the authority of Christ. He says, Peter, I'm giving them to you. I'm giving them to all the disciples. It's all yours. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. I read all that just to get to this part because there's so much there and we could deal with so much in those verses, but I want to read this. He says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem. i got to go to Jerusalem. Well, that's, you know, they went to Jerusalem to celebrate the holiday, the, the feast days and so forth. He says, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Suffer many things. I love being a follower of Jesus Christ. I love the fellowship and thank God that we can come together and, and, and fellowship with one another and, and support one another and encourage one another and uh, just rejoice with one another and have a good time. Those things are so important. They did that here. But ultimately... The bottom line is this. The Christian, and this is not popular, and people say, you shouldn't be preaching this. Well, but Jesus said that I've got to suffer many things. Listen, when you, when you decide to be crucified with Christ, there's going to be some suffering in your life. And I'm not talking about the natural things that we suffer in sickness. Let's read a little bit on. Read, read a little bit further. He says, I've got to suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Then Peter, being uh, Peter who he was, he took him aside and he began to rebuke him, saying, we're not going to let that happen to you, Jesus. You're not going to suffer. You're the Messiah. I just confessed it. You're the Messiah. You're the, you're the king. You're the one sent by God. You're the one that's going to bring deliverance to Israel. And I've said this before. We would think that Jesus might have put a star on his forehead and said, Peter, way to go. But instead he said, and I imagine this probably had Peter stuttering. <laughs> you know, when you hear something, you stutter. Huh? Get thee behind me, Satan. You're an offense unto me. For you savor not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. God help us. It's so easy, especially when we live in an affluent society, in a culture in which we live, where we're presented with so many different modes of entertainment, where there's so many, so many different things uh, in the name of Jesus, and uh, uh, we got all these channels, and we got all this stuff, and all the all the entertainment and everything, uh, and, and 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 where we, we we just we just feel so so comfortable, and we're so uh, we've just feel so comfortable. We're living in a Christian nation, you know, where there's churches. We went yesterday. 
uh, we, we, we had the opportunity to go down. Sister uh, Linda, her son, got married. And we were, we were driving down through, it was at Heidelberg or Carnegie there. And we had to go down through there. And they got, they got as many churches down there. We got around here. They had big ones, you know. Some of them were turned into uh, fellow, uh, uh, banquet halls and things, you know, <laughs> when they can't keep them going. I mean, there's churches everywhere. We live in a Christian nation. We got all these churches. If we got all these churches, how come things are like the way they are? We got the wrong idea, I think, of what church ought to be, of what being a Christian ought to be, about what being a follower of Jesus ought to be. There are some people, if you stand up and say, well, if you're going to be a Christian, like the Apostle Paul said, you know, those who will live godly will suffer many afflictions. They'll say, don't say that. Nobody will come. Nobody wants, nobody wants to suffer, right? I mean, do you want to suffer? I don't want to suffer. <laughs> but... Jesus said, listen to what he said in verse 24. If any man will come after me, if any man's going to follow me, you're going to follow Jesus? You want to follow Jesus? I have decided to follow Jesus. Have you? Let him, what? Deny him. Deny. The hardest thing in the world to do is to deny yourself. <laughs> you know, you want that last cookie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> deny ourselves. We don't, we don't want to do that. It's hard to do in those little things. But listen to what he said. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now see, now we, we have the idea, like, if you're sick, you say, well, here's my cross, because I'm sick. I got, I can't, I'm sick. Uh, I, got, I got kids that are rebelling. That's my cross. I'm bearing my cross. That, that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the problems and issues we have in everyday life. Those things, those are burdens that we, that we carry. And they're real. I'm not trying to diminish that. If you're going through an illness, if you're going through a struggle with a, with a, with a, with, with a, a loved one, if you're, if you're going through financial problems, if you're, if you're wrestling with things in your life, those things are very, very real. But that's not the cross he's talking about. He's not talking about literal things that we bear and, and stuff that we deal. The cross isn't that. The cross is who we are. Or self. Am I willing to deny my, myself? The cross is being able, willing and able and saying, God, help me live a life that's glorifying to you and not to me. Because I guarantee you that a lot of the things we deal with, what we think is good for us, in God's eyes, is not good for us. What tastes good, feels good, looks good, isn't always, sometimes it is, isn't, isn't always necessarily the best thing for us. Because those things lead to death and separation from God. He says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Why? For whosoever will save his life. Listen, they didn't want to hear this stuff. They didn't want to hear that Jesus was going to go to Jerusalem and suffer and be nailed to a cross. But he said, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. See, our idea of life and his idea of life, two different things. For what is a man profited? What is it if you shall gain the whole world? Have everything the world has to offer. Man, I got it. Bill Gates, right? Oprah. <laughs> Anything I want, buy it. Want a new house? I'll buy a mansion. Want a new car? I'll buy a Bentley. I'll go buy me a jet for the ministry. Fly around. I don't have to buy a ticket to Aspen to go skiing. I can just fly up there myself. Right? I'm, 
That's what, that's, what they, that's what a lot of them are teaching. Man, Jesus Christ will give you everything, whatever you want, name it, claim it, it's yours, and, and you just give God the glory for it. Somebody's thinking, I should have stayed in bed this morning. That's all right. <laughs> Crucified, laid behind a stone. He lived to die to rescue me. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall a man... What's your soul worth? What's, what's, what's your eternal existence? What's it worth? How much is it worth? So I was just praying and I said, Lord, I, I would love to get some messages that are, are exciting, and, but I can't help it. To just give. But God gives us to give. And the cross, when Jesus talks about the cross, he's not talking about the, the struggles that we have in life. He's there for that. He can help us with those struggles. He's not talking about the, the issues, the anxiety, the fear, the things that, that life presents us. He can help us. He can send his spirit and, 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 and encourage us. He can help us come together as believers and encourage one another and uh, and support one another. That's important. He's not talking about those things when he's talking about the cross. He's talking here about the cross. He's talking about separation. It's painful when you have to say goodbye to a loved one. It's painful when there's a separation, when there's a breakup, when, there's, when people come apart, when somebody goes on into eternity. It's painful. But if we're to follow Christ, if we're to call ourselves Christians, which means really if initially in that little Christ, if people are going to see me as a little Christ, they need to see me separated from the things of this world. I want to show you two places where we're going to read a little bit. Over in Philippians. Turn with me to Philippians. Paul's letter to the church of Philippi. Chapter 3. Again, these are all scriptures that everybody, most of you Bible scholars know these things. But we can just read them again, if that's all right. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 4. Paul was addressing some of the folks who were coming along trying to cut down the gospel. And, they, and people would come along and claim that they were trained and they were schooled and they had degrees and so forth. Paul said, well, I might also have confidence in the flesh, in verse 4. If any other man thinks that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I'm more. Paul says, man, you want to talk about what you got, what the paper you got hanging on your wall? He says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Benjamin, of the tribe of, uh, stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. He was, he was, hot, he was hot property, man. He was, he, uh, he, he was a professional law keeper. I mean, he made, he made a living of it, and he was respected. He was one of the rulers. He was one of the leaders of the Jews. And he was, he was an outstanding student. He says, uh, verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the Jews. He persecuted the Christians. He hated the Christians. Threw them in jail. And he was traveling all over the land, trying to round up Christians, putting them in jail persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. He says, I kept it to the best of my ability. Every little jot and tittle. Kept all the Ten Commandments. Hmm? Yeah? Okay. You, you keep all the Ten Commandments? <laughs> now, if I were to ask you, anybody here break one of the commandments this week? <laughs> I'm asking you to put your hands up. I mean, you can if you want to. Okay. <laughs> I put my hand up too. Maybe more than one. I won't tell you which ones. Okay. He says this. 
But what things were gained to me, all that stuff, I was a Pharisee, I, I had a position, I had power, I had a reputation, I was proud of myself because I, 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 kept, I thought I was keeping the law. I was doing all these things. I mean, I had everything that, that a young Jewish boy could ever want. He says, all those things, I count them as loss, worthless, nothing. Degrees, recognition, reputation, power, money, position. I count them as nothing, as loss for Christ, doubtless. And I count all things but loss. God, help all th- It's not some things. All things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of of Christ Jesus, my Lord. What will you pay for your soul? What will you pay for your soul? For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. All the stuff I've given up, all the power, all the position, all my friends, all the people that used to come around me because I was, I was a political guy. I was powerful. I, I lost all that. They don't want me. As a matter of fact, now they hate me. I lost. I counted it all as dung that I may win Christ and be found in him. This is the cross that Jesus is talking about bearing. He says, I may be found in him. Not having my own righteousness. Not me standing up in front of people and saying, look how good I am. It gets me sometimes when people, some preacher will stand up and tell everybody how good he is. I've been fasting for weeks. Oh. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> right. He says... For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, which could never be righteous, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I'm righteous not because I've kept the Ten Commandments. I'm righteous because I've taken my cross, because I've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, because I'm a new creature in Christ. That's why I'm righteous. That I may know him. You want to know Jesus? I want to know Jesus. Oh, I want to know Jesus. Okay. The power of his resurrection. Hallelujah. Ah, resurrection power. And the fellowship. Oh, we, we, we want to stop at the comma. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Bore his cross. He bore the cross to the hill, Golgotha. He needed help. He was beaten. He was bruised. He was whipped. Crown of thorns. All that. He said, That's good for you, Jesus. But, you know, you did it. Okay. I'll call you when I need you. That's what we do. We call them when we need them. Get in trouble. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. But when everything's going good, when things are... This is why the Bible says not many wealthy people get into heaven. I wonder if Bill Gates prayed. Does he ever ever have have to say, Oh, Lord, how am I going to afford to put gas in the Bentley? He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable, being made an image of his death. See, this is what Jesus said. Let any man, if you want to come after me and follow me, take up your cross. Not, not a sickness, not a struggle, not those things we struggle with, but this idea that we are now his and he is ours. We are in him, 
and He is in us. And that's what we do when we do communion. Him in us and us in Him. That's what it's about. A complete sellout. Thank you. See, even the best of us, we like to reserve a little slice back here. Anyway, I got this. Jesus, just once in a while, just, I'll just have this little. Verse 11. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained. Now, forgive me if I have not put this on the screen. Not, not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend. What he's saying is, I haven't got there yet, but I'm, I'm moving there. I still, got, I still got some of this flesh laying around that I've got to bring to the, to, the, to the cross. I still got some of this stuff I've got to bring to the altar. I still got some fear. I, got, I still got some, some resentment I've got to bring around to the altar. I still got some stuff I've got to deal with, but I'm pressing on. Amen. God. I'm moving in the right direction. There's stuff I don't have anymore that I used to have because I gave it to him because he took it. And there's a few other things he's working on me. Paul said, listen, if Paul said he's being worked on, God wants to work on you and me, too. Because I sure ain't like Paul. It's a separation. Dying to self. And not only is it dying to self, it's dying to the world. Turn with me one more place. And and there's so much. Well, I I can't. Let's, Let's keep reading in Philippians a few more verses. He says, Brethren, I count not myself, in verse 13, to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. I am pressing on the upward way in Christ. Father, help us. One more passage of Scripture, and then we're going to to take communion. Over in Galatians. Chapter 6. Just one verse. Verse 14. Again, the Apostle Paul writes, But God forbid that I should glory. Save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's my glory? My position? My title? My income? My bank account? My savings account? No. What's my glory? The cross of our Lord. What's your glory? What can you boast about as a believer? The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom, and here it is, the world is crucified unto me, <laughs> oh. and I unto the world. Not only have I died to myself, but I want to tell you something. By the blood of Jesus, I've died to this world. I've got to live in it. I've got to listen to it. I've got to see it. I've got to hear it when I'm not in my house and I can turn it off but I'm dead to it because I've, I've overcome. There were those, if you read about the history of the early church, there were these people that they wanted to die to the world by going out into the desert and living in a cave. Right? The, 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 the early, the early um, monks, they would, they would go into the desert, live in a cave, and they, and they wouldn't bathe, and they wouldn't eat for days, and they'd go out there, and people, would, like the Dalai Lama, people would go out there to hear some kind of wisdom. You know, they'd go out there to hear some kind of great uh, thing. And there were those who would they, would, they would build these stands way up, they would be on poles, and they'd climb up there, and they'd sit on these poles for like days and months and years, like, oh man, God's really impressed with this guy up there, never taking a bath, sitting on, that's, that's what they would, they, they would do. That, listen, that doesn't impress anybody. They would try to separate, them, separate themselves from the world by living on a cliff somewhere. But we're told that we're in the world, but we're not of it. Paul says, I'm crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to me. Separated. Your cross. 
The cross isn't your, the struggle you're going through. The cross is the separation. This cross is, is the, the understanding that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And that everything that we are depends upon Him and not on us. What's your soul worth? What's your life worth? We prepared the Lord's table this morning. So I pray, I'm praying, Lord, give me a, I'd like a message. I want to shout and jump and run around. I praise the Lord. But, but you know what? We're, we're coming in a time in this world where, where all that isn't going to, it's not going to make it. Stocking up on food. <laughs> we need to stock up on Jesus. Amen. We're going we're to partake of the Lord's table. You know, last, last time we had communion, I, I left this piece, just accidentally. This, when I always have a piece and I look at the stripes and everything. We're going to do that. But I left this sitting here. So this has been sitting here for like a month. This is a picture of the body of Christ. That's what he said, this is my body. What would happen if we would take a piece of bread and stick it out for a month? A couple a couple months ago, we had some we had some bread downstairs in a box, and I shoved it under a table, just because just to get it out of sight. I was going to throw it away, and I forgot about it. And we seen it about two months later. Oh man, that thing was like, whew. It might still be down, or I don't know. Maybe I hope somebody got it. But but there's so so I thought maybe there's nothing on this. This is just still here. And, and I thought maybe, maybe they put some kind of preservative or something in it. You know what's in this thing? Wheat and water. Flour and water. That's it. There's no leaven. There's no sin in this. Because we always say when we, when we partake of communion, we say this is a picture of the body of Christ. And we say that it's made without leaven because there's no sin. There was no sin in Christ. And it's still here. You know what? Jesus, he's always the same. He never gets moldy. His word never gets old. His promises never, never fail. His, he's always the same. Because there's no sin. I want to say, God, I'm going to bear the cross of Christ. God, I don't want to sin. Somebody said one time, how can I have peace? Here's how you can have peace. Stop sinning. <laughs> don't sin. We prepared the Lord's table, and we're thankful that we have a God that never changes. I'm going to ask d Roy if you could lead the folks around, and we're going to ask you all to, to receive the elements and uh, take them back to your seat with you so that we can all take communion together. George, could you come in? Yes, I thank you. Uh, could you come in and play? Could you play that above all? Could you play that above all again? Thank you, Lord Jesus.